we go. Hi, I'm Bob Weir with another interview of People in the News in North Texas. My guest today is Kathy O'Keefe, Executive Director of Winning the Fight, a nonprofit organization which provides drug education, support, and necessary resources to families suffering from drug addiction. Thank you for being here, Kathy. Thank you so much for having me. This is so nice. Well, uh, why don't we begin, if you would, by telling our viewers uh, why you started Winning the Fight. Um, March 20th of 2010, which we just had the 11th anniversary, we lost our 18-year-old son, Brett, to a drug overdose. It was an accidental drug overdose, and it was basically a combination of heroin and Xanax. And it was his third overdose, and he died on his third overdose. And that's what created winning the fight. Okay. And um, yeah, so this would be the anniversary of, of uh, winning the fight? It, we it, we are we actually got our 501c3 April 11th of 20 no of 2011 so we are at 10 years and we are going to have a huge celebration I'm so excited well a COVID huge celebration yeah, um, I'm so excited about it yeah. um, it's on May 6th and we're having it at the um, Hilton Garden Inn in Louisville and it's a uh, breakfast celebration so we're really excited about it and you can find information of that on our website. Okay, and your website will be on the written portion of this. Um, how, just for information, how many board members are on the winning the fight? Okay, we we have been working on our board. I'm so lucky. So we have five executive board members, and that includes myself. Kathy Duke is our president, um, and then we have six members at large. So we have a board of eleven. It's perfect fit right now. Um, everybody's real active, so I'm excited about it. That's great. <clears throat> now, when most people hear about drug addiction, they generally think only of um, heroin, cocaine, fentanyl, and other hard drugs. What other drugs contribute to addiction? Oh, that's a really good question, because we forget about so many things. First of all, cigarettes are a really difficult ad addiction to get out of. Um, it's legal, so that's an addiction. Alcohol is one of our worst addictions. We have more alcoholic addicts than anything else, anything else. Um, they, it's a very slow process for them. It's not like they take bad drugs and then die. Um, it's a different kind of addiction. Cigarettes, um, alcohol, sex addiction, gambling addiction. There's all kinds of addictions. And then you have your other things like eating disorders and other addictions like that as well, your, your secondary things. So there's a lot of things we don't deal with. We deal with eating disorders. We know where to put those people. That's very difficult. And we know about all the other kind of substance use things. We do not deal with uh, sex addiction. However, we know exactly where to resource those people to. I see. So winning the fight deals with, uh, other than hard drug addiction, do you deal with alcohol addiction? Yes. Uh, and, and nicotine. Uh, yes. So forth. Oh, right. really? That's great. Okay. We, we've <laughs> even put people into treatment for um, gaming. We have a lot of kids that are gaming addicts. Gaming. And they just kind of yeah. shift it out. Really, really. It is just as an aside, is alcohol addiction one of the toughest of all to, to break? Um, yes and no. Um, there are uh, we have we're lucky in that we have there are some medications that you can take while you're trying to get off of alcohol however alcohol is a depressant and a depressant just like benzodiazepines alcohol and like xanax all your benzodiazepines are the only two things that you can actually die from detoxing uh -huh. so you want to do a medical detox for those things and the reason being is you can start having seizures and the seizures can kill you and so we have to do a medical detox. But once, you know, there's a lot of medic medication that you can use to help with that, as well as some of the um, like heroin addiction and opiate addictions. There is what's called MAT, medical assisted treatment. And we're more and more people are starting to use that for their health. It's, wow. it's tough. Addiction is tough. Oh, it must be. Yeah, it must be. Um, I, I've known, you know, I, I'm a, as a former police officer, uh, in New York City, I, I, I came across uh, drug addiction a lot and alcohol addiction, which is a drug also. I can see what it does to people and uh, how difficult it is for them to break it. Um, let me ask you about uh, other types of addiction like uh, um, 
pain medication. Uh, do you believe that doctors sometimes overprescribe pain medication to their patients, which can lead to addiction? Yeah, that's kind of how we got into this mess. Okay, so what happened is um, Purdue Pharmaceutical Company came out with um, their oxycodones and went and marketed it and said, okay, to every hospital and doctor, nobody should be in pain anymore. And so the doctors were kind of like, oh, okay. And they said it wasn't addictive. So they started writing prescriptions for it. And all of a sudden we have this, you know, when they're testing your vitals in the hospital, pain management seems to be a vital all of a sudden. You know, you can't be in pain. You, you're getting judged by that, by the hospitals. And all of a sudden they're writing scripts and they think they've been told that they're not, they're not addicted. But um, that was not true. So we ended up having a huge lawsuit with uh, Purdue Pharmaceutical Company with which they kind of filed bankruptcy on. There's two, they paid off one and the, the current one they, they have going on right now, they filed bankruptcy. But so that's kind of where it started. And another problem that we're having with doctors is doctors get like one hour during all of their education, they get like one hour in addiction and then the rest is all their other medical stuff. And so they really don't have a grip on addiction. Some of the emergency room doctors do, or maybe you know other doctors, but for the most part, they don't really have a grip on what it actually is. So if we can start, you know, we all have to do continued education if we hold any kind of degree or something like that. So if we can start getting the doctors to start doing more drug education and addiction education, right. they'd be a lot more um, useful per se. And, you know, I've experienced the stigma and the judgment myself, having people in the hospital and they just, you know, roll their eyes. Well, I had when Brett overdosed the first time, there, uh, one of the nurses came out and actually said, I'd like to help your son, but he's trying to kill himself. So I'm not going to bother. Well, that's her job for one. <laughs> and for two, if you can't do overdoses and you're in ER, you need to go to pediatrics or something. Yeah. Well. Uh, oh, and of course, we hear a lot about opioid uh, for, for our pain, uh, opioid addiction. Uh, I had a, uh, recently I had a knee replacement and uh, because of the pain that's involved, opioid is, is prescribed, you know. So I was taking that for a while and I, you know, once you're on it and you don't have the pain, everything feels fine. But when you start to draw off of it, you realize that there's an there's a withdrawal process, and I was—I <laughs> I never experienced it before. I couldn't sleep. I, I was nervous most of the time, and I, you know, I felt like all the things I've heard about addiction, and this was minor compared to what some people who are really addicted under. So, you know, I just got a, a, a little bit of, of understanding of what it's like uh, to try to uh, come off an addiction. But anyway, uh, you like you said. Why do you uh, say that? Be Tomorrow my, tomorrow, my husband is actually having a knee replacement. And we actually discussed at the doctor's office when we went in for consultations and stuff, we discussed his pain management and how that was going to work and how they're pushing him out and things. Because I'm kind of like, you get, you know, I'll control that. And to be honest with you, we do fine with, you know, ibuprofen and acetaminophen as well. Really? Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you see, we're, we're, we're always told that uh, you need the heavier one because, and, and you know, this, this was the type of uh, surgery that, I mean, amazing, take the whole knee out, put a whole knee in. So I imagine there's a tremendous amount of pain. So you, you, you sold on uh, whatever will stop that pain. So opioid was it for a, a while, but this was months ago. And, uh, you know, it's finally out of my system, but I had a tough time getting through it. Man, a really tough time. Anyway, that's uh, something else. Let me, um, let me go on to, um, what are the signs of drug addiction that parents can recognize? You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, we fell short on this element because Brett had just started middle school. So we kind of, we kept attributing all the things that we saw to middle school, you know, hormones and changing schools and things like that. But the reality of it is, is when there's change in behavior, change in attitude, attitude was a big one. And that, you know, again, that led towards middle school for us. But behavior, um, when they stop doing the things they love, like Brett loved baseball and all of a sudden baseball wasn't important to him anymore. Those were signs that we kind of missed. And then when we started picking up on them, we were under the assumption it was pot. And we made a big mistake there, a big assumption there, thinking, oh, well, it's just pot, he'll grow out of it. And it wasn't at all. 
So you, you, you can start and, you know, parents can use their gut. When parents think something's up or mom will say, you know, something's going on with them. I don't know what it is. That's a gut feeling. Go with your gut. You just know something's going on and research it. Dig around and research it. Yeah. Yeah. I guess the people closest to them can notice the changes. Um, how about marijuana? Is that considered a gateway drug? Um, you know, um, it is. Marijuana is such a hard thing for our for our teens right now because everybody, you know, it's legal in all these states and all these people, you know, can get high and it's medicinal and they think it's a plant that's growing in the ground and and all of it's not quite as it seems. So the reality of it is, is the pot that we are um, having in the United States right now, most of it is grown in the United States under under different circumstances than it was in the 50s and 60s. In the 50s and 60s, it grew on the side of the road. In Mexico, you grabbed it up and got high and it was like three to 5% THC level. Now what's being manufactured is more like 16 to 18% THC level and it's the THC that gets you high. And then kids are dabbing, which it's a process and they make wax weed out of it. And that actually takes that THC level to 85%. And with that increase in, in um, THC levels, we're now seeing, which we never saw before because we never monitored, we're now seeing a lot of psychosis because of pot. And, and the other thing I wanna bring up as far as um, a gateway drug, you know, if you wanna smoke pot, that's fine. Smoke pot after you're 25 years old. Wait until your frontal lobe is developed. Right. Once your frontal lobe is developed, you're not gonna have those problems that most people have less the psychosis. That's, that's turning into a big problem right now that we have. Huge problem, actually. Now, we see lots of ads for CBD oil, a derivative of the cannabis plant. Can, can use of that lead to addiction, do you think? Um, no, most of that, the TH, THC, the actual component that gets you high, is taken out of that. Uh, and if there's anything, there's like a small trace. And those are the things, you know, just like hemp, there are things within that plant that actually were beneficial. Um, we're seeing some, you know, decrease in, in anxiety. We see certain things, but again, um, especially sleeping, kids have a lot of difficulty sleeping and some of the THC um, really helps them or not THC, but the, 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 the CBD, CBD oil helps. That, oh, that oil is good for sleeping? Yeah. Um, it's good for pain. I mean, and you know what? Some people it works really well on it and some people it doesn't. So maybe it's psych yeah. you know, maybe it's in your head. I don't know. I've yeah. never tried it. Um, but yeah. Um, now addicts often deny their addiction, believing that they can stop anytime they choose. Uh, what does uh, winning the fight do to help them to acknowledge their plight? Okay, typically what we do is we work with families. And it really depends on if you have an adult, somebody who's 18 and over versus an adolescent. Adolescents are hard because you are responsible for them until they get, turn 18. So our, our goal is to take the bottom. Everybody's got to hit bottom. That's kind of what everyone says. Everyone's got to hit bottom and that's fine. Let's just bring the bottom up. So we bring the bottom up as fast as we can so that they can get uncomfortable enough that they want to change. So it's much easier again, like I said, for adults because you don't have to live with your parents as an adult. That's a privilege. So what we do is we kind of set parents up and go, okay, these are the boundaries you're going to set. These are the consequences. And if they can't live through that, they're going to have to leave the premises. And that all of a sudden you've got kids that are used to living in a 3000 square foot house with heat and air conditioning, um, couch surfing for a short period of time, because that doesn't ever last very long. And then once they're done couch surfing, reality starting to set in. Where am I going to stay tonight? And all of a sudden, that's when parents have a better upper hand and we can go, okay, we can put you in treatment or you can live on the streets. It's your choice. And, you know, that's how we continue. I mean, if somebody doesn't want to get treatment, we can't do anything about that, but they don't have the right to use drugs in somebody else's home. Right. Uh, how does uh, winning the fight raise funds to support the organi organization's efforts to reduce addiction? Okay, so we write a few grants. We don't write a lot of grants because that's a lot of programs and we're a small organization locally that does quite a lot of programs as it is. 
So we kind of, um, I write certain programs, but the reality of it is we typically have two fundraisers a year. We have one in the spring and then we have one in the fall. So we're, we kind of got hijacked on COVID as did everybody else. And unfortunately we, our biggest fundraiser was our miniature golf tournament and the place they actually closed during COVID because of COVID. So we can no longer have our miniature golf tournament. We were going on our 10th year. <laughs> so we're, we're scrambling and that's where our breakfast came in now. So we're gonna have the breakfast and carry that on every year for our anniversary. And then the other one is our Stump and Stigma 5K. And it's a 5K walk and race. And we're there to stop the stigma of mental health and um, addiction. Cause you don't really have, you know we can't talk about addiction without talking about mental health. They go hand in hand and we have to pay attention to both if we want to succeed at either or. Great. Uh, well, we're coming down to the close. Is there anything you'd like to add before we end? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, we have a program out that we're kicking off um, all our stuff at the printers right now. It's called Better Safe Than Sorry. And what it is, is we're trying, we're on a roll of trying to get people to buy a, purchase a um, biometric safe because none of us know our passwords. Our kids all know our passwords. They get into everything before we can. So a biometric safe to keep in the house and lock up all your drawers. And that way, um, you know, because it may not be your family that does that, but somebody could come into your home and be a drug speaker. So if you lock up your drugs, you're not, you're not putting that out. We've lost so many people just because they were going through somebody else's drug cabinet, found stuff, started taking it and overdosed and died. So we have that program up. So lock up your drugs. That's something we all can do real easy. Um, if you're, if you need help, reach out because you can't do this alone and you shouldn't, there's no way you should. Very and then the last thing is don't think that this disease is not going to happen in your house. Assume that it will get educated about it so that you can identify it. And if it doesn't, God love you. And if it does, you're not behind the ball. Like we were, we were just always behind Brett's use constantly behind. And by the time we caught up, it was too late. <clears throat> well. Well, uh, Kathy, uh, I want to thank you uh, for all that you do for helping others to fight this curse of addiction that destroys so many lives. Can I just have a virtual hug? You know? Love it. <laughs> okay. Take care of yourself. We'll be seeing you soon. Thanks so much. Have a great day.